And he stood up and he took his jacket off. He says, you want to kick my ass? Let's go right now. Wow. And I looked at him. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe Vince McMahon wants to beat my ass. Oh, yeah, it's a new year. And if you couldn't tell from that little snippet there off the top, we are starting the year off strong. This is one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done in my entire broadcasting career. This interview is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. That's totally my voice. And I'm thinking if you haven't played this game yet, it's probably because you're just not ready for the epicness and awesomeness of this game, which by the way, is totally free to play. The reason I love Raid is because it's turn-based RPG that's done right with amazing storylines, huge boss fights, and I mean, look at these incredible graphics. I know, I didn't think graphics could get this good on a mobile game. There's more than 400 champions to collect and personally customize, and it's the only game that I have downloaded on my phone. Although you can now play it on your desktop as well. The game is cross device and you can play with the same user and switch between devices wherever you want, however you want it. The graphics on the PC version are amazing and the gameplay is super fast there. If you go to the video description and click on the links there, they must really like us because if you're a new player, you'll get 200,000 silver and this bad ass champion for free. Her name is Tree feller, and uh, as you can see here, she has rather large um, hands. She has rather large hands. All of that will be waiting for you when you download the game up in the treasure box, right up there in the top right. But you need to do this now because the offer is only good for 30 days. A big thank you to Raid for sponsoring this video. Now let's get to it. One of my favorite interviews of all time. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. I guess I got to start off by wishing you a happy belated birthday. Thank you. Yeah, it was just two days ago. Oh, you got to hold the mic up here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, 51, right? Yeah, I'm 51. Yeah, you're looking good. You feeling good? I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, could be better, could be worse. Well, I mean, what could possibly be worse? You look, you look awesome. Uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, I was just showing you a photo off camera that the, uh, the first time I ever met you was 2008. Mm -hmm. um, you, were, you came to the TV station I was working at in Toronto. You put me in the ankle lock, so thank you for that. Ah, you're welcome. It was a great honor. I'll never forget, though, I, I, uh, I laid down to do it, and I lifted my leg up, and you're like, wrong leg, idiot. <laughs> I don't remember, but I would say that, yeah. But there's like there's a there's a right way to do this, and there's a wrong way to do this. Well, it's always left, left right, left side, left yeah. hand, left leg, yeah. And, and I just lifted up my right leg like <laughs> complete idiot. Right. So I don't think people realize this, but uh, you know, because they don't see you on camera with WWE, you are still working for WWE. Yeah, I've been doing it since WrestleMania. I'm a part-time producer, and uh, you know, I help the wrestlers structure their matches. So when you say part-time, you mean just one of the shows a week? Well, yeah, I, we're all full-time, but I, you know, I do Raw every week. Uh, there are some producers that do both, Raw and SmackDown, but um, I'm focused mainly on Raw. So, you know, obviously with the experience that you had, you know, with all the years you spent in the ring, what are the things that you need to do to be a great producer in the job that you're in now? For one, pay attention to the show, see where the storylines are headed, uh, watch the the athletes, the superstars wrestle, and and uh, see where they need improvement, and you know tell them what their strengths and weaknesses are. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's just um, it's from every aspect, though. It's not just the wrestling part. It's the storyline part. Okay. It's the structure of the show, and uh, it, it, there's a lot of work. Do you remember a specific producer <clears throat> in your time in WWE that really helped you craft a storyline, craft a match? There were three that really, really helped me quite a bit. And, uh, one was John Laurinaitis. <clears throat> um, the other one was Pat Patterson. Uh, Pat was extremely highly educated on structure matches, uh, coming up with great finishes, uh, things you never saw before. Pat Patterson is the guy that, um, that invented the Royal Rumble. He, right, he yeah. came up with a lot of concepts that WWE uses today. So he... Um, he was my 
my favorite, him and John Laurinaitis. When you returned to WWE after you know eleven years in TNA, was it the plan that you were going to wrestle a little bit, have the on-screen role with, as the GM, and then go into this backstage role? The plan for me was to wrestle first, um, do the GM second, and Hall of Fame third. Um, okay. For me, they went the opposite. They did the Hall of Fame first, GM second, wrestle third. Uh, that that was. For me, it was a lot harder. <clears throat> I think a lot of people, you know, see a wrestling "quote unquote" retirement on TV or on a pay per view like yours with uh, WrestleMania, and they go, "Yeah, but that's just a wrestling retirement." Right. Um, you know, we know how those all work. Yeah. Uh, is is this it for you, or do you have another match in you? No, I'm done. I I, I knew I was done when uh, when I went to Vince and told him I wanted to retire and. Um, just had my last match at this past WrestleMania. Um, I believe he wanted me to go another year, but I, I just didn't want to do it anymore. I I know what I'm capable of now, and it's not enough for me to uh, be comfortable going out there and performing. If I can't do it like the old Kurt Angle, I don't want to do it anymore. So the plan to go another year and then maybe this WrestleMania, WrestleMania 37, you would have your final match? Yeah, most likely with John Cena. But um, I chose not to because I wanted John last mania, but we already had a storyline going on with Baron Corbin and myself. And Vince said, if you're going to retire, you're going to finish with Baron Corbin, you know, uh, if you don't mind, because you guys have a great storyline. We're not going to just stop. And Vince was right. So I, I said, OK, I'll, I'll wrestle Baron and. You know, that's it'll be my last match, and that's it. There, you know, there, there wasn't any way to work this in to have that match with John Cena. It would have been, you know, so poetic to do that. Um, I, I think it was thought of. I, I think it was thought of for the following year, but um, you know, it, because I wanted to retire early, and you know, Vince McMahon wanted me to continue the storyline with Baron. There was no possible way. I, what, what was ironic is when I got to WrestleMania. I, I did my throwback to my team angle and I wore the hoodie yeah. and Cena did his throwback. Yeah, we, yeah. we never talked to each other. We just walked <laughs> up to each other and said, what are you doing? And uh, so the, that was from way back from 2003 and um, it would have been kind of cool to bring that back and wrestle John. Well, I think when Cena's music hit there at WrestleMania, I mean, I was there. I think that people were expecting it to be some sort of a, figure out some sort of a match between you guys. Right. Well, I, I knew that John didn't have anything planned or at least nothing long-term. So uh, I already knew I was wrestling Baron, so I figured John was going to do something quick like he did. Yeah. Have you looked back at that match with Baron? Are you, are you happy with the way that it went? Yeah, no, Baron's a great wrestler. He's, uh, he's a great talent. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like him, but uh, he's he's really good at his job. He's a great – he's the top heel in the business right now. I uh, – now, I know that people might naturally hate him, but that's a good thing. Like, everybody thinks, well, he has real heat, not not WWE or wrestling heat. It's yeah. like, well, that's the point. He wants to have real heat. So, um, you know, I got the rest of the top heel in the business. At WrestleMania. That's the way I look at it. And that's kind of the thing is, you know, the plan is that you want to go out putting someone else over, and you certainly oh, put yeah, Baron over. I, I, I didn't expect to win, not against anybody, so... Um, I figured I would lose my last match just like everybody else. With the amount of time that you spent in TNA, did you ever think that you'd be retiring in WWE? Yeah, I knew I would go back. I just didn't know when. Um, it, you know, it, I, I probably waited a couple of years too long. Um, I did stay in great shape when I got back to WWE in 2016. Yeah. And uh, I was ready to wrestle. I was wrestling matches that year. I took a year off and I... I just focused on wrestling. I wrestled Rey Mysterio. I wrestled um, Del Rio, Cody Rhodes a couple times, uh, three times actually. Um, so I was just trying to keep my body fresh and also get enough activity to keep me uh, in enough shape to, if I did come back to WWE, I'd be ready. And when I did, um, you know, Vince McMahon and Triple H, you know, pulled me aside and said, we're going to induct you to the Hall of Fame first. Mm. Is that okay? And I said, yeah, but I'd rather wrestle first, you know, but uh, I didn't have any options. And I think I understand why. I don't think it was um, to uh, <clears throat> criticize me or because I, I did leave the WWE high and dry in 06. I, uh, <clears throat> it was my choice to leave, and 
I know Vince and I didn't part on good terms and I went straight to the other company. Um, but I, you know, coming back, Vince never forgot. I, I had a painkiller problem and I had a severe neck problem. And I think when Vince brought me back, he looked at me as a liability. Mm. And uh, I think that's why he had me do the shorter matches. He, he had me help put talent over. Um, they, he never really ran with me with a title run or anything like that. So I was expecting that because, you know, Goldberg came back, had that. I think even Sting had a, uh, at least a title match. Uh, but uh, it wasn't in the plan. So I, I don't blame Vince for that. I think that um, me being a liability with my five broken necks and my painkiller problem from a long time ago, I don't think he wanted to see me fall back into that. Sure. That's the whole reason. When you originally did leave WWE 2006, when you went into TNA, did they allow you to do things that maybe you weren't able to do in your first time with WWE? Uh, you mean like from a... Um, creative standpoint yeah yeah uh yeah i mean we you know we we came up with a lot of our own stuff and uh but we had a good writer as many as a lot of people want to pick on vince russo i i loved him i i thought he was really good at, at his writing i the, i think the problem was you know there were a lot of talent that weren't willing to do what he wrote right. so when it was when it came down to tv time Nothing really meshed together because you have talent saying, I'm not doing that, I'm going to do this. And all of a sudden the story turns into something different or or it phases out and doesn't really work. So uh, Vince was always, Vince Russo was always on top of stuff. He was writing. I, I did everything he told me to do. I, I trusted him that much. So unfortunately I didn't get to uh, work with him in WWE, just left right before I went on, uh, before I debuted. But... Uh, Vince was a great writer. I had a great writer in WLB with Brian Gewurz, and uh, I was very blessed to have those guys. When you uh, first left WWE, was there a, let me just straighten this out, I'm sorry. Was there a plan for you? Uh, did you know you were going to go to TNA, or were you just like, I'm not going to be here, uh, and I'm going to figure the rest out? Um, <clears throat> when, uh, when it went public that I was uh, released, um, I got a phone call from Dixie Carter and Jeff Jarrett. And um, they asked if they could fly up to meet with me. So um, they did. So this was probably a week after I got released. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we worked out a deal and got it done like that day. It was wow. really quick. I'd say it took us 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I felt badly, too, because I told Vince McMahon the week prior that I'd be back in six months. So, you know, I, I, I went after it because... It was a reduced schedule. The money was, from a guarantee standpoint, just as good. Yeah. Uh, so I knew I was guaranteed that money, and I knew I would wrestle a lot less. Yeah. And uh, it just was more appetizing to me at that point. But this was around the same time when UFC was reaching out to you, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it, had things happen in reverse order, maybe you would have been in an octagon. Yeah, you know, uh, but, but I also knew in the back of my mind... Um, once I broke my neck uh, the second time, the first was in the Olympics in 96, or before the Olympics in 96. Yeah. The second one was in 2003, and when that occurred, um, I lost a lot of strength in my upper body. Um, I was having, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, circulation problems from my neck going down my arms. Oh, Couldn't wow. feel my hands. I uh, lost a lot of strength in my arms. I could only bench at the time 135 pounds. Wow. Um, so for me to go in the octagon after all that trauma, um, it wasn't, I don't think I could have done it. Uh, unfortunately, if it, before the broken neck, I would have said, hell yeah, it'd have been great. I would have had a great run. I probably would have won the uh, world title. You never know. You never know. <laughs> but um, I, I, it was more appetizing to me than pro wrestling. Of course, you would have won the title. Oh. <laughs> There's nothing you, you, anything you set your mind on, you accomplish. I appreciate that, but it's not an easy sport, and there's some badasses out there. Uh, but you know, whether I did or not, um, I knew, I knew in the back of my mind, I couldn't do it. And uh, and Dana White gave me a great offer. I thank you, Dana. He's been really good to me. I've reached out to him a couple of different times, and he was willing to talk to me and you know give me two separate deals, two separate times. And, wow. 
I backed out, and and it, it was it was you know, I just knew I couldn't do it, and I knew if I did it, I'd probably embarrass myself, and I I didn't want to get to that point in my career, so I decided just to wrestle, because Dana wanted me to quit pro wrestling. He, I said I just signed with TNA. Yeah. He said, well, you have to quit that too, and I was like, can't quit. I just signed with him, and you know, so it didn't work out. Would you, you think you would have fought as light heavyweight, 205? Yeah, I would have been yeah. a light heavyweight. I, I, I would have fought in heavyweight division, too. I, <clears throat> um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I always paired well against bigger guys. Uh, I don't know if you remember when uh, Randy Couture beat the one guy, seven foot tall. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, don't look at can't remember things. his name, but Randy also is really good at that. He always worked with guys bigger, heavyweights. Yeah, yeah. And me, too, so... I, I wouldn't have minded going in there with anybody that was 280. It's fine. Maybe if UFC was you know as popular as it is now, when you came off the Olympics, well, you, you probably good. wouldn't have had a WWE run at all. That, that's what I tell people. I um, you know, if, uh, I got offered in '96. UFC offered me, but they offered me a ten fight deal for 150 grand. That's 15 grand a fight. Right. That's not worth it. Especially I mean, when you're a name. Yeah. 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 So um, I, I, I had to pass on it. And I'd say about six, seven years later, it just exploded. And it's because of Dana White, he did a tremendous thing by reigniting the company. But, um, yeah, I, I, I knew if I would have done it right at the Olympics, you know, I probably wouldn't be in pro wrestling. I mean, I, I was an amateur wrestler in high school and into college as well. And I, I know that you weren't supposed to watch pro wrestling because that right, was the right. quote unquote fake stuff. What was your first introduction to pro wrestling? Well, I, I started watching it before I... WWE contacted me in 96. I turned down that offer. In 1998, late in the year, I just started uh, watching it. Turned okay. it on every week and, uh, you know, watching The Rock and Stone Cold and Triple H, Undertaker, those guys. But my biggest inspiration was Austin. Um, uh, I really enjoyed watching him perform. Um these guys were really good athletes. I, I, I never watched it before, so I'm watching them perform these stunts and going, wow, man, these guys are serious, you know, world-class yeah, athletes. Yeah. So I called WLB and said, can I get that contract still? And they said, no, but you can try out. So that was like a guaranteed contract they originally yeah. offered you. Yeah, it was a 10-year deal, yeah. <laughs> so I turned it down, and they didn't <laughs> offer me it again. <laughs> I had to work for it. Right. So you, you had to go in and basically start from the bottom, but it was so impressive seeing you in in there because you took to it so quickly. How many parallels were there between the Olympic style and WWE? None. I had to forget <laughs> <laughs> forget everything I learned. Well, um, I know wrestlers don't like to be on their back. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, yeah, the back and the, you know, everything else, the stunts, uh, even the, the showing the emotions and just stuff that you don't normally – you know, doing amateur wrestling. You focus on your opponent. The job is to take them down and pin them, and uh, there is no storytelling. Um, you know, and you have to show emotion. You have to show you're afraid or you're angry or you're upset or excited, and, um, you know, you have to be able to talk on this right here. And, yeah. Uh, there, there were a lot of facets to it. The only thing that I got out of amateur wrestling that I was able to bring into sports entertainment was – my suplexes. Other than that, everything was completely different. Yeah. When someone refers to you or Bret Hart as, you know, the best to ever do it, how does that make you feel? Great. I, um, you know, I, I, I know how good I was, um, especially uh, in 2003 to 2006, barring no injuries because I broke my neck, geez, three, three times. In that Did you break it in a WWE ring? Yes, yes. Let me see. I got hit over the head with, by Brock once, broke my neck with a chair. Um, wow. and Brock also uh, ran across the ring. I was on his back, and he kind of turned sideways, and my neck whiplash, and my two vertebrae broke there. So two with Brock, <laughs> uh, one with Eddie Guerrero at WrestleMania. I did an angle slam off the top rope and uh, landed on the back of my head, and my <laughs> neck broke. And then uh, in 2006, in January, I broke it right before I wrestled Undertaker at No Way Out. So that was four times. Um, those Outside those injuries, I there was nobody better in that, that per period of time. Nobody. But um, unfortunately, I, I kept going down with neck injuries. It just wasn't working out. Yeah, that, that match you had with Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania where he goes for the shooting star press and 
he almost broke his neck. Yeah. Was that supposed to be the finish of the match? Yeah, yeah, that was my idea. And Brock was doing it in OVW yeah. years prior. And um, I just wanted him to have a WrestleMania moment. I didn't know he was going <laughs> to So uh, he, he did miss. But the cool thing about it is that's what people remember most about WrestleMania 19 is Brock missing the moonsault. Uh, so it was a great moment for him. And uh, we, we, I love wrestling Brock. He was so physical, just like me. And uh, we, we would trade back and forth. And uh, I enjoyed wrestling probably more than anybody. That, so that was going to be the finish, though? The shooting yeah, star? Yeah, that was the finish. And uh, unfortunately, he missed. And um, I was trying to, you know, he, he, was, he was knocked out for a little bit. He was on Loopy Street. <laughs> and uh, finally, he was able to get me up for another F5. And he delivered it and won the match. And there were rumors that the next year, it was going to be the dream match of all dream matches, you and Bret Hart. I don't know if you've ever addressed this. Was that actually the plan for WrestleMania 20? Well, I was trying to get that done. Um and I, I understood why Brett didn't want to do it. Um, me being at 51 now and looking back, and if a young Bret Hart came to me right now and said, hey, let's do our dream match, I'd be like, it's not going to be the dream match that I'd like it to be. Yeah. I probably don't want to get in that ring. And, you know, so I understood why Brett didn't want to do it because he, you know, he had the stroke and he had a lot of bad luck, you know, some, some things that were... Uh, you know, medically, you know, difficult for him to be able to come back and be at his very best. Sure. So I understand why. And he he wanted to be the Bret Hart that everybody adored, you know, and uh, so did I. I was, you know, yeah. I even told him, listen, you don't have to bump at all. I'll do all the bumping. And he was like, nah, I just, it won't be the Bret Hart match I was, that I wanted to be in. I, I can't do that. And I, I completely understood. There was also another rumor that you were originally in talks to be the first ever um, universal champion. Champion, you know, with, with his, and then it was ended up being Jericho with being the unified champion. Do you well, know what ended up happening there? Yeah, I, I, Vince McMahon came to me two weeks prior to the tournament and said, "We're gonna, we're gonna give you the strap again, and uh, you're gonna be the uh, undisputed champion." Undisputed champion. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, you know, I thought that was pretty cool considering it was the pull was Chris Jericho, Rock, and Austin, Austin yeah. which is, you know, those three are among the very best of all time. Uh, so um, I knew going into it that I was going to win. And then about five days before it, Vince gave me a call and said, Hey, I really want to get Jericho the, the title. I think that he would benefit from this. And I agreed. I was like, Vince. If anybody needs it and would run with it, it would be Chris Jericho. So I'm I'm cool with that. I I, I was really very honored that Vince had enough respect for me to tell me, listen, but we're gonna switch it instead yeah. of just doing it without telling me. He yeah, yeah. wanted to get my feelings on it, and I, I agree with him. Chris Jericho, uh, it benefited him, uh, put him right in that title, you know, picture and main event, and and Chris was always up in there he's always up in the main event but you know he come down to make card and then back up the main event and he was such an important factor of the company because he did he, he could make anybody look good yeah. so uh, you know he we used him wherever wherever we needed him he was like one of our most important assets so him getting an undisputed title really uh took his career to another level well i feel like if you wanted, if he wanted, if Austin or Rock wanted, I mean, everybody wins in that situation. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think that, um, but you know, at the time, Chris needed it the most. Yeah, uh, Austin Rock definitely didn't need it. Yeah, um, I could have used it, but I didn't need it. So um, I think they made the right choice. And Chris Jericho, <laughs> I, I I have more respect for him today than I ever did. I can't believe the things he can do now. Yeah, and it sounds like through what you're talking about with your story with Vince, that you had a pretty great relationship with Vince throughout your run in WWF slash WWE. Yeah. It was, is that, was that something that continued on afterwards? Or when you left in 06, did, you know, did that kind of burn a bridge for a little while? Oh, it definitely burned a bridge. Um, Vince and I were really close. It, it was the last year and a half. Um, I got out of control. Um, you know, I was uh, doing a lot of painkillers and... I was getting injured quite a bit, and I was wrestling full time, and it was really getting to me. I mean, I was tearing my hamstring, then my groin, then my abdominal muscle, and wow, it just my knee, then my shoulder, my back, my neck, and uh, it just got to be too much. And the painkillers, you know, I, 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 
I was taking up the 65 extra strength Vicodin a day. And, I've heard uh, that story, and that's just, just crazy. Just 18 at a time and chewing them in my mouth and swallowing them. Um, wow. I, um, so <clears throat> I, I was a wreck. Uh, Vince didn't know this, and back then they didn't have that drug policy. So they, you know, up until 05, 06, they didn't, they start drug testing. But before that, you know, you you could do whatever, whatever you wanted. So um, uh, although I, I, you know, I, I was really... <coughs> I was really screwed up physically, mentally, psychologically, um, and I, I had to leave. And when I, when, we, when I did, Vince and I never spoke again until I came back in, uh, two years ago. That moment that's captured on camera? Yeah. Wow. I talked to Hunter, Triple H, yeah. for a couple months, but never Vince. And um, the first time we saw each other, and we hugged each other, and you know, I apologized to him for the things I did and said, and you know, he said, "Don't worry about it. We're we're back. You know, we're back to normal." And uh, so, you know, Vince has always been a father figure to me. I I never want to intentionally hurt him. Yeah. But um, you know, I remember. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll give you a quick story. Yes, please. I decided I wanted to quit. And my manager and I, we went to the headquarters. This is in 06? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. What happened was I injured myself real badly. My hamstring and groin. There was blood, uh, blood all over, my, my, across my genitals, my hamstring, both legs, running down both legs on the inside, like uh, bruising. Wow. It was really bad. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I showed it to Vince uh, when we had a meeting, and I said, um, we need to talk, Vince, because I'm... Uh, I'm not doing really well. And so he pulls out about five uh, type pages of text messages and uh, phone call messages. I left them. And I'm reading. I'm like, it says, Vince, I'm going to beat the shit out of you when I see you. Vince, um, you know, better answer the call or I'm going to kick your ass. And really, really crazy stuff. Wow, and you don't remember and sending I was it? Like, no, I was, uh, I was at the point at the time, unfortunately, I was taking uh, Pankos and I was taking Somas. And, you know, every once in a while I would black out. And here I am, text events. And uh, so he showed me all these. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I actually said this stuff. And he stood up. And he took his jacket off. He says, you want to kick my ass? Let's go right now. Wow. And I looked at him. I'm like, oh, my God. I can't believe Vince McMahon wants to beat my ass. <laughs> you know, this this guy's been my father figure for seven years. And I, I have too much respect for him to stand up. And uh, But he wanted to go. <laughs> he wanted wow. To go. And uh, I left the room, and I came back, and I, I just broke down. And I said, Vince, I can't do this anymore. Um, I, I need you to release me. And uh, he did, he did. And, uh, you know, sometimes I look back and I wish he didn't, but, you know, it's it, it had to be done for me to save my life. And uh, and I know I wasn't, uh, I wasn't representing WWE the way Vince needed me to. In other words, he's a publicly traded company. Sure. You know, he has a liability on his hands with the broken neck, the painkillers, and whatever else. So... It was it was time for me to leave, at least for momentarily. But he wanted to release you and then have you go into rehab, right? Yeah, a year prior, he wanted me to go to rehab. And um, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, in 2006, when I you're right, when I uh, quit or when I asked for a release, Vince wanted me to go to rehab. You're exactly right. And uh, he, you know, he said, "I want you to go for a couple months and come back in six months, and we'll." we'll We'll start your contract back up. Yeah. And uh, so I said no. Mm. And uh, I didn't want to do that. And so I I decided I'm going to leave and I'm going to go to TNA. So I had the option, go to WWE, stay in WWE and go to rehab or leave and go to TNA. And I don't regret it. I loved my career in TNA. I loved Dixie Carter. She was incredibly good to me. Uh, but, you know, what sucks is my... My best phase of my career was in TNA. Hmm. I, as good as I was in WWE, yeah. I was the best there. Yeah, I got better in TNA, and uh, unfortunately, the WWE universe will never see those matches. Well, there's probably a lot of people watching this that have only watched your matches in WWE. So, yeah. if someone's watching this and they want to see one of your best TNA matches, right. what should they watch? Uh, anything with AJ Styles, uh, uh, Samoa Joe, Bobby Roode. Uh, 
Desmond Wolf, uh, Ken Anderson, the Sting, gosh, Stinger. Uh, but there are a lot of a lot of great people. Yeah, your uh, matches with AJ were yeah, all we had a lot of fun. AJ and I had a great uh, we had great chemist, chemistry. He, yeah. everybody has great chemistry with AJ. So <laughs> everybody has great chemistry with you too. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I can't even think of a bad Kurt Angle match. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't have one. I, I don't know. I wouldn't remember. <laughs> So in TNA, when did you realize, oh, my God, maybe I do have a problem. Maybe Vince was right. I, I, need, I do need to go to rehab. I, I, didn't, I didn't see it. I, I didn't. Uh, I, I knew deep down I had a problem, but I was in denial for so many years. Um, I mean, I, I didn't consider rehab until I got hit with a DUI, and it was my fourth one. Okay. Um, yeah. And the reason why I never quit, never went to rehab, never, um, uh, you know, s stopped doing it uh, is when I got the DUIs, I would go to court and they would be either thrown out or be a lesser offense. And I, to me, me, it was like, well, I don't have a problem. I mean, obviously, I, I blew uh, right on the level of uh, 0.08 or 0.078 and I wasn't really drunk and I wasn't really high and I... You know, I I was able to uh, make myself believe that I wasn't, there's nothing wrong. So yeah, yeah. Uh, four DUIs in five years. And uh, for the last one, I was in jail and I called my wife and she said, I can't do this anymore, I'm going to leave you. And, uh, and uh, she said, if you go to rehab, I'll consider staying, but I can't do this anymore. So uh, I went because of my wife and my kids. And wow. it was the best move I ever made. The story you're telling here sounds kind of similar to what Jeff Hardy is going through right now. Okay. And, you know, you worked with him for many yeah, years in yeah. TNA. You know, what kind of advice do you have for someone like him? Um, it's not, it's not hard. It's not easy. I mean, with, uh, going through this, this, these problems, especially with alcohol and drugs, um, you know, I don't know what the issue is with Jeff. I don't know if it's, you know, it could be he's in so much pain uh, from his body which I, I completely agree. I, I, sure. I think that Jeff, out of anybody, uh, his daredevil stunt work that he does uh, night in, night out, uh, he has, his body has to be shot. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a way to uh, cope with pain, but, you know, drugs and alcohol is not the way, although it, it, it helps temporarily. Yeah. Uh, it's not the way to cope with pain. So, you know, I'm always praying for Jeff. I love the kid. And, uh, uh, I know he can pull through this. So since, you know, after you went to rehab, obviously things worked out with your wife. You're, I know you're very focused on being a father now. Mm -hmm. How much did that change your life? Oh, it changed everything. I, um, I never spent any time, time with my kids. I, uh, you know, I, I, I would get home after touring and I would, uh, I would drink a 12-pack of beer and I'd take a couple of uh, Soma or, or Xanax and pass out and wake up the next day and, and uh, never even talked to my kids. Mm. Um, uh, that you know, my wife pointed that out to me, and I was like, "Oh my God, you're right. I, I'm just coming home, passing out every day, and uh, not really spending any time with any of you." So uh, that's what changed my life. Uh, when I came home from rehab, I started getting a relationship with my children and my wife, and it was so much better and so much. Uh, it was so much better than being high and trying to isolate myself. It was better to have the love of my kids and my wife, and uh, I don't, I don't ever want to lose that. I know sure. if I go back to it, I will lose it. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to lose that. And yeah. was it, was there, you know, was it hard to build that back up with them? No, no, they were actually very open and forgiving, and yeah. you know, my especially my wife. Uh, but she, she's the reason I did it. Um, you know, people say, you know, Kurt, you're, you know, it's because you're strong internally and you, you know, you, you deserve the credit. No, my wife, um, my wife got me to believe in what was important. And uh, I, I never, I, I didn't grow up, um, I guess. Uh, my dad was very, um, very hard worker, but he wasn't affectionate. Uh, we didn't hug or anything. We shook hands like men and. Uh, I was very distant from my father, and I, and I started feeling that with my kids, mm. with my isolation, drinking and stuff. And my dad drank every night. He he would drink till he passed out. And I was turning into my dad and like, oh, God, uh, I need to stop this, you know. 
Uh, and when I did, I realized, uh, you know, I, I get these, I have kids that love me and, you know, they, they want to be with me. I, you know, I never thought about that. My kids want to spend time with me. Why? I'm boring. I, I you know, all I do is, you know, travel and come home and pay the bills. I'm, I'm not an exciting person. So, but they wanted to spend time with me, which is really cool. So that's that's more important to me than anything. It I, it's great how open you're being about this, and I love that I love that you've been able to you know reconnect with your family. And I think I speak on a lot of fans' behalf when I say that it's great to see you know how good things are for you right now. Thank you. I I feel really good right now, and I uh, I like what I'm doing. I like where my life is headed, and uh, uh, it, the hardest part about now is letting the young guys step in and take the place that I had. And when you're when you're older, until you get older, you don't really understand. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to be those guys still, but you can't. Yeah. It's like anything, pro football, you know. Deion Sanders, you don't think he's thinking about, in the booth where he's commentating, yeah. you don't think he doesn't think about getting back out there? Now, Deion might be able to do it still because <laughs> he's, he's... He's in great shape, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He probably could still run a 4-1. <laughs> but but for the most part, you know, when you get older, uh, you lose that, you know, ability to to have, you know, world-class athleticism and uh, be able to display it the way you want to. So if you can't do it the way you want to, then you don't want to do it. But right. it must be so hard for someone like you who did it at the very best of the best, at that top level. What was the moment where you're like, I think I might have lost a half a step? Uh, I would say that was... Um, when I went to rehab, okay. <laughs> 2013. Okay. When I got out of rehab, um, no more painkillers, no more Xanax, no more alcohol, no more somas. I um, I had to just you know go on trying to maintain my body, stretching, yoga, you know, uh, working out, and it it was my body just started to age hmm. very quickly. Um, I don't know if it was the painkillers that were enabling me to continue on and feel young, which they probably did. But um, yeah, now I had to be smart because now I'm feeling every bit of pain I have in my right. neck, my back, my knees. And uh, I'd say that's when I started losing a step. And, and that had to be 2013, 14, yeah. And you've been so. clean and sober for how long now? Uh, since then, August second, two thousand thirteen. So almost six years. Yeah, congratulations! Five and a half years. Thank oh, you. That's great. We uh, we recently had uh, Ken Shamrock on the show. He's great. I love him. And he said that the one match that he wished he would had. Me too. Was yeah. you? Yeah, Kenny. Uh, when I started um, in WWE, I I just started, so I was just training. But I would watch Ken's matches every week. He was the guy that I tried to portray, and I actually did. I took his ankle lock. Uh, he, he was the first one to use the ankle lock. Uh, but I always picture myself wrestling him. Mm. Main eventing in some pay-per-view, and unfortunately, you know, he left and uh, started fighting again, and uh, we were never able to make it happen. I know that sometimes storylines in WWE end differently than what the original plan was. Was Jason Jordan the original end of that storyline? Yes, Jason unfortunately got injured. Um, that would have been um, my match at Mania, uh, this past Mania, Jason. So, it would, you know, that would have been, I guess, potentially your retirement match. Yeah, yeah. And, and not that Vince wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, he wanted me to go another year. But, yeah, in, initially, I mean, for, for the most part, yes. Uh, Jason would have been my last match, and it would have made sense. I, I um. I adore that kid. He's uh, so talented, and you know he got a lot of heat for being my son. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and he played the part great. That's why people hated him. He was he was being a spoiled brat about everything, and you know he was using me to get what he wanted. So it was it was a great. Vince was great with that. It, a lot of fans really did hate him, just like Baron Corbin, and uh, I I think that's good. Some people think it's bad, but I think it's good. And he was. He was really good in the ring, really good. Or were you surprised by the backlash in general? Because it wasn't just on Jason; it was also on you for being part of that storyline. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I didn't mind it at all. I, you know, for the, for the what little fan base that enjoyed it, um, I, I thought it was a great way to bring Jason in. I thought it was a great way to, 
you know, you're going to make this kid a son of Kurt Angle, a WWE Hall of Famer, he's going to go straight to the main event right away. And now right. you have another main eventer. Right. So it, it was a great way to bring Jason in. Jason has a great look. His, uh, his communication skills got better, and uh, he, was, he was ready to go. How's he doing now? He's good. Uh, you know, I, I do expect him to come back. Um, he's he's still waiting. For, he has some problems with his circulation and using his left hand. So uh, he's going to have to uh, he's have to wait a little bit longer. But um, you know, he might need he might need another surgery. That might be the reason why he's still not able to function properly. But he's he's a lot better than he was, and he got his strength and his size back up, and he looks just like he did before. Because I think there was some concern that maybe he wouldn't, you know, ever wrestle again. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that was, I think that was the initial, you know, diagnosis was you yeah. Uh, but uh, the surgery went well, and Jason's been improving slowly. I mean, heck, it's been what a year and a half. So yeah, I don't know how much longer he can wait. Um, he might need to see another doctor and look for another surgery. So, how many days a week is the current WWE job for you? Um, well, including travel, two to three days a week. Great. So, yeah. what do you do with the other, you know, four to five? I do appearances and. Uh, yeah, actually, I saw you recently in New York. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And um, I also, uh, when I'm home, I'm taking these kids to everything from karate to gymnastics to swimming to <laughs> uh, dance to I got so much stuff here. Uh, I literally don't have time to have a career. I, the being a dad is. Uh, the busiest thing I've ever done. I mean, I have kids with speech delays, so we got to get them to therapy. And I mean, we we were running around from the when we get up till we go to sleep. Uh, my wife and I, we we're actually getting our, our a date night tomorrow night just so we can get away. Yeah, hey, all kids. right. Yeah, so uh, my my in laws are gonna watch the kids, but uh, I never have time alone with her anymore. I just, having six kids is crazy. <laughs> Do you have a future WWE superstar in your household? Your uh, kids? Well, one wants to be our adopted son, Joseph. He's a big WWE fan, and he, you know, he, he wants me to get him a tryout when he gets older. So <laughs> I told him if he's if he does well in school, I'll I'll get him a tryout. And and you're okay, you know, with having one of your kids be a wrestler? No, no, <laughs> uh, I um, it's it, the thing is today it's not so bad. Um, you know what Vince McMahon has been able to do with the, the drug policy, the wellness policy. Um, you know uh, these guys having to go through physicals every year. If they can't pass physical, they can't wrestle. Uh, the food that they serve at the uh, arenas is incredible. Uh, they have personal trainers and doctors and, and trainers, and uh, so they 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 catered so much to the athlete right now that I would feel okay with it. Yeah, yeah. Back when I was there, we didn't have any of that. We, we yeah. were lucky to have a doctor. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a lot of good things that Vince McMahon has done to keep the company ahead of all the other competition. I think, I mean, obviously people know you for the great in-ring work that you did, but mm -hmm. some of your best mo moments, we saw this in your Hall of Fame induction, were the stuff that happened outside the ring, like the yeah, milk truck yeah. and... I don't know if everybody knows this story, but that wasn't actually all milk. You were spraying on people, no. but the stuff in the cartons was, and you have this great story about like, you got this milk all over your clothes and on your shoes yeah. and then had to get on a plane smelling like milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was my fault. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I just got done and I had milk all over me and um, there was a red eye flight in an hour. And it was the only flight I could catch that night. So right. I, I went soaking wet. <laughs> I got on the plane, and after about three hours, you could, it smelled like sour milk. And everybody's <laughs> looking around like, who stinks? You know? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and, and like, obviously, you got off the plane, and you throw those shoes out? Yeah, I had to throw the shoes so. out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it was funny. I mean, uh, you know, anytime... Uh, I, if I could do it all over again, I would. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to see the looks on those people's faces <laughs> at the plane, yeah. Some of the other great moments were like the stuff with Austin, Austin and Vince. Yeah, um, we do, had a lot of fun. Do you still have the tiny cowboy hat? No, no, I, I think Steve has it. He's really? Like, oh, yeah. He, he, well, he's the one that bought it. For real. He saw it in an airport. He's like, I need to get this for Angle. So... Um, <laughs> We had a lot of fun, and the crazy thing is, most of those uh, 
segments were not, uh, there was no verbiage written. It was an idea that Vince came up with, that, or, or, or Steve Austin, and they just said, listen, let's go with this, you know, say your verbiage and whatever you want to say, and uh, uh, at the end, uh, don't laugh. Just don't, whatever you do, don't laugh, because if you laugh, it's, it's gone. Right. So uh, they don't want to catch anyone laughing on film. So um, we were doing the segments, and... Uh, and once once Vince would yell "cut," everybody would start laughing so hard because we couldn't <laughs> contain ourselves. But it was so funny; we had such good chemistry. It was, uh, yeah, Deborah and Steve and, uh, and Vince and myself, and we had a lot of fun. And you ended up embracing it, but did the "you suck" chance ever get to you? No, no. I, uh, you know, you know, it started with Edge, and yeah. you know, he. Um, it, it, it did stick, and well, at first it was angle, yes, yes. angle, yeah, and uh, yeah, Edge came up with it, and uh, you know, I, I, I liked it. I, I, the thing is, the more I went crazy, the more they did it. And right, I was like, this is cool, you know. I, I got them. They think they have me, but I have them, you know. And uh, it, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun doing that, especially the night when I told uh, everybody that, uh, you know that I earned the right to be called, you know, that I suck. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was pretty cool. I, when, when you were about to return for this most recent run, I'm like, they can't, they can't sing. You suck. Kurt Angle's too good. And then well, your music hits and they did. There it they is. always will. Uh, you know, the, it's great. Cause the WWE universe, they always want to be a part of the show. And, uh, anytime that they could be a part of an entrance or, a segment or a match, you know, they're they're going to want to be part of that. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. That's, that's why we entertain fans and why we go, we travel around arena to arena to let people see this from a live standpoint yeah, yeah. and to be involved in the show. So the You Suck thing is just, you know, one thing that we do that, that the fans are able to do every night, you know. Uh, Daniel Bryan, it's yes, 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 you know. At Austin. least that one's positive, though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, what about Austin? What? What the hell's that? <laughs> yeah, I can't believe that's still around. I know, I Almost know. 20 years later. Yeah, there's a lot of fans still do it. You're right. What do you think it is inside of you that's always made you want to be the best? I mean, it was the case even before you won the Olympic gold and then going into WWE and still to this day. I don't know. I just, uh, I've always... Whatever I step into, I, I end up uh, falling in love with. Um, uh, you, when, when I get married to something, I do it excessively. So when I, uh, when I wrestled in the Olympics, I trained excessively. I, I knew what I wanted, and I knew where I wanted to go. Same with WWE. Uh, you know, a lot of people were saying, Kurt Angle's you know, transferring from Olympic wrestling to pro wrestling, and he's not going to get it, and he's, he's going to be an intercontinental champion at most, which, by the way, is a major honor. Sure. Uh, but, um, you know, they, they were trying to say that I would never get to a level of main event status. Um, but I did, and uh, I knew why I did, and I knew what I had to do. I, I spent a lot of time getting ready uh, on my own because – you know, back when when I started, we didn't have OVW. We had a, the Dory Funk Dojo, and there were two camps. They were both five days long, and that was it. Mm. Then they quit. Wow. We, I didn't have anything. So yeah. um, I didn't really, you know, Vince McMahon didn't really work with me with promos or pre-tapes. Or, uh, all I did was worked on wrestling, and I, I did uh, dark matches every week for Raw and SmackDown, and that was it. Wow. And then I, you know... The night he started me on TV, he wanted me talking, and I was like, Vince, I don't know if I can do it. He said, well, we'll find out. Yeah. And he said, we're going to throw you in the river, see if you sink or swim. Yeah. Which of the three eyes do you think is the most difficult to do? <laughs> which, which is the most difficult to have? Um, I would say, for me, integrity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good at intensity and I'm fairly intelligent, but, uh, my integrity in the wrestling ring, um, you know, I was, I was mainly a heel, uh, most of my career yeah. and, you know, um, I would always preach the audience about, you know, having integrity yeah. and I never did. So, you know, <laughs> which was, is why it worked. Yes. Yes. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. Vince yeah. came up with that. Uh, Brian Gewertz and Vince McMahon came up with the stuff that I did, what I said, um, 
like I told you, I didn't have any experience. I, I didn't know how to be creative to write myself promos and, and uh, you know, do... I would do what they told me to do. And every week they had something great for me. It was like I was a little kid in a candy store just, like, picking whatever I wanted because, yeah. you know, fortunately, you know, from a heel standpoint, every week I stole a show. Yeah. Not just from wrestling, but, yeah. like, you know... You know, doing the you know sexy Kurt or you know, <laughs> um, you know the wrap off with Cena or the milk thing or you know just uh, bringing a motor scooter out for for Undertaker and <laughs> just I had a lot of dimension to me and and uh, and the Brian Gewertz and Vince McMahon made sure of that they they made me a very complex character and it was it was a lot of fun. Is there anyone, I mean, you've been working a lot behind the scenes in WWE. Is there anyone there that you think has the intensity that you had in your prime? Uh, where, in NXT? In, in WWE, NXT, wherever. Um, I, I'm really high right now. I, I really like this Ricochet kid. Um, mm. uh, he is, him and Ced, Cedric Alexander. Um, I just, I had their match this past week. It was on main event. And this man... <laughs> These guys have taken wrestling to another level. I mean, this it's no longer ground wrestling. I mean, these guys are in the air flying. Yeah. And and they don't they don't do it too excessively. They do it they do it the right way, you know, when you need it or you know, they're not just doing it to try to be cool or make it look cool. It's whenever you need it, that's when you go to the air. And uh uh, I think guys like that, I you know, like the the two hundred five live division, Buddy Murphy, and uh, you know he's starting to come into his own. Alistair Black, um, you know, these guys are really really good, and they're going to have big careers. Well, I want to be uh, respectful of your time, mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to say. Thank you so much. It's been Thanks, man. such a pleasure to chat with you here today. I know you have to pick your daughter up uh, very soon here, but uh, what an honor to chat thank with you. you. I, I thank you so much, and I'm glad to see you're doing so well. Um, the bio accelerator with the stem cells really helping uh, you my out. My shoulders have gotten a lot better. I'm yeah. still, uh, they say it takes two to six months for uh, recovery, so it's only been two months. My shoulders are good. My neck and back are still waiting on it, but I'm opt optimistic. Well, it's, it's such a pleasure to sit with you and hear all these stories and... Uh, Thank you for everything. Uh, really. You, appreciate you. you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Kurt. Oh, yeah. Starting the year off with a big one. Uh, thank you so much for checking out this chat with Kurt Angle. What a great guy and easily one of the best to ever do it in the ring. Those are some amazing stories he was telling there. I feel like that interview could have gone on at least another hour, uh, but I want to be super respectful of his time. He told me he had from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock today and then had to leave to pick up his daughter at 2.15. So, uh... We milked that to the absolute last second. Milked it, huh? See what I did there? Um, this interview, by the way, though, almost didn't happen. Um, I'd been in touch with him through BioAccelerator, uh, the stem cell company that's helping him on his road to recovery. And Kurt said, I've got this day and I've got this one hour blocked off. We're gonna make this thing happen. I said, absolutely. So I'm thinking Pittsburgh's like a four and a half to five-ish hour drive from where I live in Cincinnati. But I'm like, we're gonna make this happen. Where should we do the interview, Kurt? He said, you tell me, and I'll meet you there at 1 o'clock. So I actually, I uh, booked this hotel room, the one we did the interview in, um, just so we could have a place to do the interview. So I basically, I checked into this hotel, did the interview, and I'm about to check out right now. So I'm going to spend like exactly one hour in this hotel. I'm sure that most other people that check into this hotel for an hour do other things here. But the interview almost didn't happen because I figured four and a half-ish, five-ish hours to get here. I'm going to leave my house at 7 a.m. to drive here and get here by 1. Well, it took me five hours and 57 minutes to get here. So I rolled into the hotel at 12.57, checked in, got my hotel room, and then three minutes later, Kurt Angle was sitting in that chair right there and we were making this interview happen. Uh, wow. So uh, we're starting the year off big here. This is just the first one of the year. Thank you for all the milestones last year. Um, 100 interviews. Um, thank you for 100,000 subscribers last year. I mean, I started the year with a little over 100,000 subscribers, ending the year at like 212,000 subscribers. Um, thank you. And we're just beginning here with uh, 2020. So the goal for this year, the goal last year was 50 wrestling interviews in the year. The goal this year, 100 interviews in 2020. Guys, that's two a week. Can we do it? 
Hell yeah, we can do it. Vague goals get vague results. 100 interviews in 2020. Boom. Let's make it happen.